Welcome to this installment of the Dynamic Impact Test Procedures Training Class Lecture Series. Today's topic will be seat family modifications. Just a quick disclaimer, certification approvals are based on federal regulations, official FAA policy and certification engineers. Do not take anything that is said during the course of this training to be a certification opinion. If you need certification advice, please seek out your local um, ACO. As an overview, this lecture series is companion material to the online course, Aircraft Seat Dynamic Impact Test Procedures History and Background. FAA participants may find this course available in ELMS, and industry participants may find this in the designee registration system. So today we will be talking about seat family modifications. These will be following the, the seat family concepts and these will be modifications that you can make to your family of seats design, post-certification and changes. Some will require testing, some will require analysis, and some you can just make right ahead and just show that it's an acceptable modification. So, so we're looking at changes to seat components. The goal is to have small changes that do not, that do not constitute a new seat design. So you'll be looking at variations of the basic seat design and what you can change. And as I mentioned, some may require additional testing, but possibly the additional testing could be at the component level. All the material that's contained within this, this seminar is actually contained in AC 25.562-1B or otherwise noted herein through official FAA policy. So, Looking at our seat components, let's first start with the seat track fittings. Some of the changes and variations to the seat track fitting that will be acceptable analysis are if you're changing the locking mechanism, the adjustment engagement device, such as a screw, the bolt, or plunge are acceptable, as long as it's not part of the load path or it does not change the load path. So, for example, if you install, if you alter the method of stud engagement, that might be part of the load path because that's the part that's reacting on the, uh, the seat track lip. You can make changes to the seat track finish um, as long as the method of finish application does not affect the strength of the part, such that if you had a finishing process that included a hardening or something else, that would affect that material, in which case you would need to investigate further. Moving up from the seat track fitting, let's look at the seat legs. So as I mentioned, fittings, attachment, you know, you might have to test. If you change the basic geometry of the seat legs, you could possibly test or conduct analysis based upon the, uh, the extent of the change. The material, in most cases, if you change the material from which your seat legs are manufactured, it's going to require a retest. If you're changing the energy absorption mechanism, such as how it's incorporated in the seat and how that, that load is fed, possibly test or possibly analysis. Um, some of the changes we're gonna look at, basic design and seat geometry, so say small local changes to the legs. Fittings, including attachments to say cross beams and spreaders. Component tests may be appropriate instead of full scale tests in some instances. So look at the seat legs. Some variations that are acceptable without additional tests is that if you can show by rational analysis that the strength, stiffness, and the permanent deformation are equivalent to or less critical than the originally tested seat. In other words, the floor fitting loads are equivalent or less critical than the seat leg of the tested seat by conducting your interface load analysis. So you would go through and conduct your same sort of decision tree to determine your critical seat that you would test and you would make a determination that these changes do not change the criticality of the seat that has been selected. So for instance, if you're changing the, <coughs> the, uh, the stud distance, if you were able to show that that change in the stud distance would give you a similar critical selection and does not change your interface loads, then that might be an acceptable change. So looking at the lateral beams or the cross tubes, some changes in the local doublers are acceptable, such as you insert thickness, you insert length, you insert location. 
provided you can show by rational analysis that the strength, stiffness, and seat permanent definitions are equivalent to or less critical than the tested seats. The elimination of a local doubler in some locations of seat assembly may be acceptable by rational analysis if you can clearly demonstrate the adequacy of the attachment without the doubler. However, this is probably unlikely because you would have installed that local doubler in there for a particular reason. So it's unlikely you would just be removing it. However, maybe it was there, the doubler was there for some sort of um, stiffness or strengthening insert for a clamping force that, that you no longer need that particular clamp. So you were now removing that local doubler. <clears throat> so if you have a nested tube, you can change the variation of that nested tube. Again, if you're changing the, the length and the location, if you're showing that the strength, stiffness, and permanent deformation are equivalent or less critical in tested seat. Now that one phrase there, you're gonna see repeated probably throughout the remainder of, of this module. Um, variation in the lateral beam length to accommodate dis differences in seat width are acceptable. Provided the seat is included in your interface load analysis used in a test article selection. So possibly you're looking at a seat installation in a tapered section or your, your track is moving and you need to change the width of one of your seat places, in which case then you might have to you shorten or lengthen your, your lateral beam in order to get that additional uh, seat, seat width. <clears throat> the spreaders. So variations to the part of the spreader that is not in the primary load path. So example, the part between the uh, seat belt and the seat back attachment in the top of the armrest are acceptable without additional analysis. Part of that's because that portion of the seat spreader does not react any load. Um, changes the armrest attachment may vary provided by, provided if the, it doesn't extend in the seat back or seat belt load path. If this variation does not affect any potential ATD head contact area from an occupant in the seat design. So if you were to change that portion where maybe it extends further or you change that material and it now creates a new head strike location, you would need to assess that change for the head strike. And it can be shown by rational analysis that the retention of the armrest is not significantly affected. So if you're modifying that part and then suddenly it changes that, that attachment to the armrest such that you think you might lose the armrest in a test, you would need to show that that's, that's not the case. So looking at the spreaders, again, you look at the spreader bars, it mentioned you know, an armrest change is not likely to require a retest. Your seat back attachment may require a, a test or analysis if that's the side of the seat attachment that has your recline mechanism. As we know, those recline mechanisms change the uh, stiffness of the seat in that local location. So you may have to look at what that effect would be on the HIC. Um, if it's part of the, uh, the spreader, which has the uh, seat belt attachment or it's supporting your seat pan, that's likely to require your 16G forward test. So armrests, if you have a variation to your armrest that's in a potential occupant head strike location should be substantiated by analysis. You may have to conduct an additional rotor row HIC test to if the geometry and material variation of the armrests in any seat with an ATD head contact area from the seat behind. So if you're making changes to this location, you're going to have to assess that if this becomes a likelihood of a head strike and you will need to assess it for HIC. <clears throat> Additional changes may be required if for instance, the armrest has an influence on your ATD occupant such that it would change the location of his arms and his interaction during a down test. In that case there, you would then need to conduct an additional down test to show that your lumbar loads are still within the, uh, the requirement. So the seat pan, so this is the pan, the part where the cushion sits on. You can change the bottom cushion support geometry such that you're looking at, again, at small differences in seat place width. So here we're defining small as three inches or less, provided other aspects of the geometry and method of attachment do not vary. Um, variations that support that under the SRP, you have to show the SRP does not vary more than half an inch in any direction 
from the SRP of the tested seat. Then in general, of all other features of the seat remain constant, head excursion with respect to the seat is shorter where the SRP moves aft. Similarly, structural loads to overturning moments decrease as SRP is lowered. These general trends can be examined to eliminate duplication of some tests. <clears throat> so other changes that can show is if you show by rational analysis that the, again, that the variations have no significant influence in increasing lumbar collision, compression loads. This includes looking at the deflection underneath the pan such that you do not have contact occurring with any item beneath it. Perhaps your initial certification test had an IFE box located below the seat, and now you're expecting an increase in that deflection. You want to assess and show that this increase in deflection does not now cause a contact with that item below such that that would um, increase your lumbar loads. Again, also the strength is equivalent to or less critical than the tested seat. So the seat cushion, the seat cushion is probably one of the primary components that people always want to change. Primary consideration for the seat cushion is looking at it, the cha these changes and how it affects the lumbar load and the positioning of the occupant and the seat place. Contour variations are acceptable without additional structural tests, provided that the SRP does not vary by more than three quarters of an inch in any direction from the SRP of the tested seat. Experience has shown that geometry variations in an area three inches forward, two inches rearward, and two inches sideward of each buttock reference point have the most influence on the, on the SRP. This area is about where the hard points of the ATD pelvis sits on the cushion. So that would have the most interaction between the ATD and the cushion that's going to modify that SRP. You can vary the seat fabric cover without additional analysis. This, this is provided the variations do not significantly affect the SRP location. So for instance, if you have an approved seat cushion and you, your original testing was with leather on that seat cushion and you now needed to swap the material to a fabric, then you can <clears throat> swap that fabric on, assess your SRP and not conduct any additional analysis. This also, this, the limitation here is this also is not allowed if you have a padded dress cover. So if you have a half inch of foam in your dress cover, and now you're trying to remove that foam out of the dress cover, then you would have to go through and conduct an assessment. However, another way of conducting assessments, if it's a case that you have changes and you want to uh, replace the seat cushion with a different seat cushion, is an FAA policy memorandum released in 2005 that describes a component test method for compliance to the 25562C2, there's the down test for injury for replacement of seat bottom cushions. This applies only to non-flotation monolithic replacement cushions, and it was based on research and tests that were conducted for the FAA in the, uh, the report that is listed here. The basic methodology is that you're measuring a reaction load from each cushion throughout a deflection cycle. The test is conducted on both the originally certified cushion and the proposed replacement cushion material. You're going to collect a, lump, a load deflection curve and you're going to compare that against a maximum lumbar load criterion curve. You'll also compare the deflection of each cushion when it's subjected to a 1G occupant loading. So here you can kind of see the, the test device and I'll describe it in a little bit more detail, but it's going to be a compression type device of a component of the, uh, the seat cushion. It will be a circular component of uh, seven and a half inches that'll react against the, uh, the, the mass. The test specimen, as I mentioned, will be a cylinder seven and a half inches in diameter. And the thickness represents the unloaded thickness of the position of the ATD buttock reference point. So you look at your cushion, you determine what the thickness of your cushion is at the ATD buttock reference point, and that's the thickness that you would use for your test specimen. It's also representative of the actual assembly, so any, including any foam and fire blocking material that may be part of that cushion assembly. The test procedure is you will then dynamically load the specimen 
at approximately 30 inches per second up to a maximum deflection of, of 0.9. Then you'll also statically load the sp specimen and compression to 130 pounds to determine the 1G static preload deflection. So this looks at how much that foam would support a, an ATD buttock in the static load that would that kind of covers the SRP uh, testing point. Then you compare it, you, you see this report for, for the test loading and sampling criteria that goes into more detail at how you'd actually collect this data. But then once you have this data, what you do is you compute a load deflection criterion curve, and then you validate your calculations using the report, and then you determine the acceptability of the proposed cushion from the document performance requirements. So from this, you'll, you'll, you'll look at a criterion curve and your new one, and then you'll have a usable region. And as long as your cushion response then falls within that usable region, it's considered an acceptable cushion. However, if you fall outside of that reusable region, then you would not find that cushion to be acceptable for replacement using this component methodology. For some, there's some limitations. Again, see the report for, for all of them. One of a couple of these are the proposed and certified certified cushion should be similarly constructed as follows. We want the thickness within a half inch. Each cushion is a monolithic non-flotation cushion. And a methodology is only applicable to cushions that have load deflection curves described in the report. If you look through, there may be some other variations of load deflection curves that this would not be applicable to. And as I mentioned, all, again, this is also not applicable to cushions that incorporated padded dress covers. <clears throat> so now let's look at some variations uh, and the certification changes for the seat back. The primary consideration for this component regarding variations is how it affects the seat back position angle and occupant positioning. The occupant positioning may affect HIC or lumbar load. So occupant positioning will change the, uh, the velocity and the location of any head strike. Also can affect the structural performance and seat back permanent deformation. <clears throat> so variations excluding potential head contact areas, which do not significantly affect the mass, weight, CG, or load path stiffness are acceptable without additional analysis. Variation of the seat back structure width up to two inches are allowed without additional test, as long as the variations in seat width do not introduce new structure in the target head strike location. Variations greater than two inches may require additional tests for your HIC and your BC deformation. Variation of the backrest cushion hardness and contour are acceptable, provided that your SRP does not vary by more than three quarters of an inch from the SRP of the tested seat. Variations in the seat back upright position of plus or minus three degrees are acceptable as long as you can show it has no influence on occupant egress from the airplane when evaluated using the seat permanent deformation data from the baseline tests. So for instance, if you collect your deformation data, you can then do an, uh, conduct an additional analysis where you could add in this, uh, this additional rotation of three degrees and show that you are still within acceptable deformation limits. <clears throat> And additional variations of upright position are acceptable with analysis that the variations do not influence HIC or egress for the person in the seat or the person behind the seat. Now let's look at seat belts and anchors. That's another component that is commonly uh, replaced. Some may, may be simple and some are a little bit more complex. So for instance, if you need to change the labeling on the seat, that, that is acceptable. The FAA has determined that color changes are okay without a retest. Um, changes to the buckle without a retest, as long as the load path remains unchanged. So you can change the finishing or opening angle, um, the method of how the uh, passenger might, might pull on that to show that that change is acceptable. Changes on the adjustable length are okay without a retest because the adjustable length will be adjusted to the proper location during the test so a little bit shorter, a little bit longer is okay, as long as you're still within the uh, <clears throat> adjustability that's needed for your range of occupants. However, if you change the, the internal mechanism for the buckle, that's gonna require a retest because you need to ensure that that change, the internal mechanism does not now bind the seat during a, uh, a change. If you have a change to the webbing material, 
So you want to swap from one type of nylon to another or a nylon to a polyester, that, that material change would require a retest. Most changes to the closure mechanism are okay. As again, as long as you are not changing the load path. <clears throat> um, other considerations. Once you have a belt system qualified for a specific seat family, so you qualified the belt in your family of seats, it can replace other qualified belt systems on that same seat family. So in other words, to qualify a new belt on an existing family, you have to conduct at least one 16G structural test of the highest loaded leg pitch normal must be performed. This structural substantiation is sufficient to allow the use of the new belt on the seat family. So if you had a change, you can conduct it on your, your most critical seat, approve that belt on that most critical seat, and then it will be eligible for installation on other seat family parts. That way you don't need to go back and test every configuration of that seat to approve that new belt. Um, when you conduct that test, you're gonna compare the ATD head path for the, seat, the new belt system and the old belt system. It can be done on either the structural test noted above, or you can conduct an additional 16G forward head path test, depending on what data is available for comparison with the old belt system. So if you had head path data collected on the original structural test, you can now run the a, a structural test here and also collect head path data and do your substantiation. Then the approval, as long as the head excursion along the entire path, the new belt system is equal to or less than the old belt system, no additional substantiation is required. The head excursion along the entire path, new belt system is greater than the old belt system. Installation limitations may need to be modified to account for this difference. If you have multiple belts as part of an existing seat family and a seat component is changed in a family that require additional testing, it is not necessary to retest every seat and belt combination. You can use the four reaction loads from the 16G structural test for each belt may be used in selecting a single belt for use in testing future changes on the seat family. So you would choose the belt system from the most critical test, and that is the one that you would use on your additional retest. <clears throat> the belt used for the test will be the one that's the highest floor loads. If the test using the new seat component generates significantly higher floor reaction loads, in other words, we, we consider significantly higher to be greater than 10% or more, Compared to the test without the new seat component, the belts that were not tested must be addressed to ensure that they have significant strength. So in other words, if your loads increase significantly more, you're gonna to need to go back and make sure that that's within the strength of your belt system such that you now don't get a failure in, a, uh, in another design. A plan outlining any additional tests or analysis of non-tested belts must be reviewed with your appropriate regulatory agency. So, however, many times you don't have enough of the, uh, the original belt data or you don't have the uh, original test articles that you want to go back and conduct this full test. There is another policy memorandum released in 2005 that describes a component level test on a rigid seat for replacing seat belts and 562 compliant systems. This covers both lap safety belts as well as torso restraint systems. The method uses a rigid fixed seat instead of the representative production seat. The performance of the proposed replacement restraint system is compared to a restraint system previously certified via test. However, the geometry of the systems are essentially the same in terms of locations where the webbing segments attach to each other and the hardware. So here you can see it's you have two rigid seats that you would run simultaneously on the sled and conduct with both a new proposed belt as well as your certified belt and collect data that you'll compare to each other. To set up the test, the certified replacement restraint system mounted a rigid seat fixtures. The fixture installed side by side in a on a common dynamic sled, so they'll be subjected to the same impact pulse. And then you're gonna install measurement devices to determine your strength loads applied to the anchor points as well as collect your head path data. Now, the policy as it's written follows this methodology where you conduct one test with two different ATDs side by side. However, you could also propose to use one rigid seat and conduct two separate tests using the same ATD. 
it was determined that the variation between two tests is probably in the same range as the variation between two different ATDs. So if you only have one rigid seat fixture available, then you can conduct this test in two different parts, but still collecting the same data. To set this up, the restraint, the anchors, your anchor locations, the seat cushions, your ATD position, SRP, should be representative of the certified seat. So you would take the geometry and design information from your proposed certified seat and use that to set up your rigid, rigid seat such that your belt angles, your attachment locations and the path would be very similar to your, your certified seat. Seat cushions should be of the same construction and the ATV, ATD feet should be in the same relative position as when it was seated in a certified seat. So in other words, you're trying to replicate that initial certification test. However, you're doing it this with a rigid seat. Um, then the test procedure, you're gonna follow your 16G forward test and described in 562. Some differences are your, your seat fixtures are not yawed, so you can keep them completely longitudinal. Because it's rigid, you're not going to deform the floor. As well as these are rigid seats, you know, using facing forward, even for a test that's supporting a restraint system on an aft facing seat. You'll then compare the performance of the proposed and a certificated restraint systems. The acceptance criteria are the peak restraint load should be within 6%. The point of your maximum ATD head excursion, so your head pass should be within one inch. There should be no significant differences between the ATD head trajectories. The proposed and the certificated restraint system should not experience a structural failure. And if you, and if you have inertial reels installed, the month they should also meet the requirements of SAE AS8043. Some additional criteria to torso restraint systems. Each segment, except for the fifth belt of a five point system, should undergo a static test. Or alternatively, a proposed restraint system is considered to have sufficient strength if the peak loader reacts during the rigid seat test is equal to or greater than the peak load reacted by the restraint segment during a certification testing. Some other considerations the tolerances. They're provided as part of acceptance criteria and not to be used to justify acceptability of an installation. So if you were to run this test and show that your head path excursion was one inch less, you cannot then use that one inch change to change your seat pitch and installation. You're still subject to the initial cert certified seat installation limitations. This method compliance is only applicable to restraint systems with webbing sensitive inertial reels. It is not acceptable to compare one replacement restraint with another replacement restraint that has been previously approved by this method. So this method, you have to always go back to the original certified restraint system that was on that seat in order to conduct this comparison. <clears throat> so let's move on to fittings and fasteners. So variations between structural members due to space geometry limitations are acceptable without additional tests provided. The attachment has the same design philosophy and it can be shown by rational analysis that strength and stiffness are equivalent to or less critical than tested seat. If it isn't, a single longitudinal or vertical test is sufficient to substantiate attachment between structural members with a different design philosophy or variations within the same design philosophy provided it can be determined which test condition is critical for that attachment. So possibly be, because you have a, a, a variation or change, you need to remove a rivet or an attachment point. Uh, you, if you can show that that attachment point has no effect, you, you don't have to conduct an additional test. However, if you were to change maybe the, the fitting type, so it was a different type of rivet or something like that, a different material, you might have to then go back and conduct an additional test to show that that is now required. So seat weight. The seat weight has a significant influence on the seat performance during the structural tests. Small vari weight variations are acceptable, but large increases must be substantiated by test. These variations are accounted for in the critical test case evaluation by the interface load comparison. Remember going back to that decision tree, you would have then looked at the weight and its effect on the uh, your interface loads. And then depending upon what your interface loads 
um, told you, you would have selected the, the seat that had the highest weight with the highest interface loads. However, proper planning of your test article definition and testing can make accommodation of future seat weight growth. This can be accomplished by adding ballast to the test article. So for example, if you're expecting that you may have additional components installed on your seat in the future or other changes that may increase the weight, you can go in and ballast your initial seat such that you have that higher level weight included in your baseline testing. By including that higher level weight, when you achieve that seat weight growth, you've already shown that the seat components can withstand and react those higher loads from that higher weight, in which case then that would be acceptable. If you hadn't done that, or you got a little bit more weight increase, if, as long as you're within 3% of an increase from your total unoccupied seat test of weight, then you would be okay. However, given increase of the weight of the seat, not including the baseline testing, it, you have to also look at where that weight is being added. So you would still have to go back through and use your seat interface load analysis with the pre-seat weight to show that it was selected for the structural test. So the first part, the 3%, is you're looking at your baseline tested seat. However, if, you, if your seat weight, you also must go through and look at if you're incre increasing the weight of a different seat in the seat family that was not included in the initial test, you want to show that that increased weight does not now change your critical test, test case analysis. So if you had two seats at your seat family, one was tested and one was not, for the one that was tested, you can allow up to 3% of the unoccupied test system weight without a retest. For the one that was not tested, you have to go through and conduct an analysis and show that for the one that was not tested, that this increased seat weight does not now make this a critical case that should have been tested. <clears throat> Some other points to consider. If the weight increase to any seat is due to adding a specific item from a specific location, you must address the retention of that item from the, from the component to the primary structure. For items where the strength attachment method is the only issue, a static analysis test may be sufficient. So maybe you are adding a, a small box or another device and you have a clamp or other method of attachment. You do have to assess that that attachment method can react the loads and remain attached. Items that are likely to affect the dynamic response of the seat, dynamic testing must have substantiated local retention of a similar item of representative weight and attachment. So if it's an item that might affect the performance, you have to show that that attachment methodology had been previously tested and shown to be acceptable. Then depending on the location of the added component, testing the component question for retention may be conducted on a partial unoccupied seat. Again, speak with your regulatory agency in advance and achieve some further guidance on your specific changes. So in conclusion, some modifications are allowable within your seat family after certification. The key here is you want to maintain the same design philosophy, such as method of attachment, material, um, design construction, fabrication, and you can make some small variations to those in the geometry that you can conduct without additional testing. However, some changes may require additional testing. In those cases there, you have choices in some of those, particularly the cushions and the belts, whether you have to do a full system test or this or a component level test may be possible. So thank you for participating in today's webinar. Stay tuned for additional content to soon be available on additional